So welcome everybody to tonight's talk or this afternoon's talk, depending on where you are, The Bats of Jamaica by Damani Calder. Damani is the Environmental Officer for the Fauna Unit in the Ecosystems Management Branch at Jamaica's National Environmental and Planning Agency, known as NEPA. And he's also President of BirdLife Jamaica, and as Liz says, has various other sorts of involvement with different kind of uh, societies that are involved with Jamaican wildlife. And I, I know, again, that that's something that he's been interested in from a very young age and has a very wide knowledge of. He's well known as a public speaker on the biodiversity and ecosystems of Jamaica, and he's got extensive knowledge of many different aspects of Jamaica's fauna. So today we are lucky enough um, for that he's going to take us on a journey to investigate the habitats, and the lifestyles of the island's amazing bats. And it's over to you now, Damani. I will stop sharing and we're ready for you to take over. Thank you very much. Are you able to share your screen? Yeah, that looks fine. And I think you might be muted if you want to unmute yourself. Great. Hi, everyone. Thank you for that lovely introduction, uh, Liz and Maria. I'm, you know, you mentioned that I am a well-known public speaker. I don't think myself as such. I keep, keep getting asked to do these things, so I try. Um, but, um, so today we're talking about the bats of Jamaica. Now, my, I want to say, foray into bat conservation, looking back at it, it has been a little while now, but it started after being employed at um, NEPA. I've been there for about 10 years now, and I was introduced to, to bat surveys through my now senior manager, Andrea Donaldson, who had studied bats before. And we were involved in doing island-wide um, assessments. We were looking at um, not necessarily population density, but presence, absence of species in caves around the island. And that's where it really started. And it sort of snowballed. As Liz mentioned, I'm involved in many things, as many of our uh, local biologists are. We sort of straddle many disciplines. But it's been snowballing and pointing me to do a lot more work with bats um, for various reasons, which we'll get through in the presentation. But um, this presentation is going to be sort of a generalist presentation, but it's going to skew towards um, an introduction to the variety of bats we have, some of the challenges they face, and actually the conservation work that is um, happening. So let's proceed. Um, this lovely bat that is on the first page, uh, most people see this photo, and it's a lovely portrait. Um, by Angela Sota, I happened to be there when this photo was taken. Uh, people see it and say, oh, it's a little piggy bat. You know, they don't expect such a cute bat, but this is actually a Jamaican endemic, the critically endangered Jamaica flower bat. But, hold on. Right, so don't want to assume, but a quick introduction um, of what, what a, what's a bat? It's the only true flying mammal. While there are other um, mammals that glide, like flying squirrels, um, flying lemur, which isn't a lemur, um, there are things that jump. There are other, there are other gliding mammals, but and gliding marsupials. This is the only true flying mammal. And it is indeed a mammal, it does have mammaries, it suckles its young, it has fur, it is a placental mammal, so they give live birth. And they are numerous across the world, you know, over 1,400 species. They live in a variety of habitats, just not extreme cold. 
they evolved to navigate in the dark as they are primarily nocturnal. Some are crepuscular, you know, early evening, early morning, but typically night. And also where they do roost, they need to be able to navigate the darkness. This is a quick uh, overview of the anatomy of the bat. It's important to take note of the head and the interfemoral membrane, that little space between the back legs and a sort of a tail there and the skin. It's going to come up later. So for the Jamaican context, um, our native mammalian diversity isn't that high. So we have the Jamaican coney, which is a hootie, a rodent, there's a photo there, sort of a guinea pig rabbit sized um, rodent. We had a monkey, which we have fossil evidence of, and a Jamaican rice rat. The monkey may have been extinct as a result of human introduction and the rat because of um, human introduction, but by way of introduced species like other rats and um, the Jamaican mongoose. In Jamaica, we have 21 species of bats representing six families. And for the island, um, for an island of a size, it's uh, quite a significant number because it places Jamaica as one of the most bioendemic islands in the Caribbean. Um, not just for mammalian diversity in the type of bats, but you know, frogs, birds. If you're here for Ricardo's talk earlier in the year, you would have mentioned that as well, insects, plants. And a quick cultural anecdote. This is a black witch moth and Jamaicans call moths bats and call bats rat bats. Uh, this one in particular we call Doppy Bat, and a Doppy is a spirit or a ghost. And um, we, so often when you're speaking to persons and you mention bat, sometimes there's a little confusion in about exactly what you're speaking about. But when you say rat bat, they know exactly what you're speaking about because you know bats are confused with rats, even though they're not related in the least. But you can understand why. Quickly going to mention a bit of the geography. Admittedly, this I did not dive deep into this, but this is a very important um, aspect of why there's such a great bat diversity in the Antilles and indeed Jamaica. But as Jamaica there with the 21 in the middle, as you can see, is located in the Greater Antilles. You know, it's the third largest island. Uh, Cuba, Hispaniola, and Puerto Rico are there. And Jamaica is made up of a lot of limestone. And because of its limestone, the geology with the limestone and the amount of rainfall that we get throughout the year, over millennia, We've developed many karst systems, many caves. Uh, some of these caves are very, um, are very unique. Uh, I'm going to mention that a little later in terms of how they constrict and hold temperature. But the sheer no volume of caves around the island pro uh, provides numerous habitats. And these caves can be found in all sorts of forests as well. So from wet limestone forests in which you know there might be in a rain shadow in an area that's heavily vegetated that um, like have more precipitation dry limestone forest areas with less precipitation and a different type of vegetative cover uh, along the coast we have caves along the coast um, low in sea level high mountainous regions you name it their caves are on but this map I included, thought was interesting, and it's from the Bats of Jamaica. It shows the number of species 
in Jamaica in relation to the shared number across the Caribbean. So you see, while we share a lot of species with Cuba, we have a, there's a bit of a feedback, someone so. Right. Um, we sort of have a, a, a bit of, of everything from the region and then have our own unique uh, species. So, so a quick introduction to our bats. Uh, we have, as I mentioned, 21 species and they broke, we break them up into um, their, their niches. So they have based on what they feed on and how they feed and also where they hang out. So we have 14 um, insectivores. We have nectivores that um, feed primarily on nectar. Among those insectivores and some of the nectivores, you have foliage gleaners. So some of the insectivores, they fly around, they catch things in the air, others, glean vegetation if anyone's familiar with birds it would be like the little warblers that sort of go through and pick around but more precise uh we have our fruit eating bats the frugivores and then we have one fish eating bat in addition to these bats there are three additional species that are known from fossil um the fossil records and these are extant bats so they're still alive but not in not present in Jamaica. So at some point, these species were present here, but for various reasons, um, went extinct on the island. And of these bats, there are a few that are not only, it's not that they're just found in Jamaica, but they're also restricted to um, the Antilles. But let me see if this actually plays. Hold on. Oops. Okay, it's a quick video. It's a Jamaican flower bat. Um, as you can see, the long tongue. This was when we were doing some work um, at the Stony Hill Cave. And before we let them go, especially nectar feeders like hummingbirds, they burn a lot of sugar and we sort of give them a little boost before letting them go. But that's just so you could see the equipment it has there, the tongue. That, the, diving a little deeper into the bats, here are some of our insectivores. And remember I mentioned earlier the interfemoral membrane. You can see how prominent it is on some of these. And some of these bats are called free tail bats in which the tail extends beyond the membrane. So this one here, um, which is uh, a widespread bat um, within the Americas. As you see, its name is Brazilian C, so it was first described there. So it's called the Brazilian free tail bat, the Mexican free tail bat. Um, you can go to Texas and see one of the largest roosts for this bat and emergence. This one, the ghost face bat, a really interesting and spectacular bat. It's the Antillian ghost face bat, so it's found in the Antilles. And this is one of Jamaica's three Terranotus, no, yes, three Terranotus um, species. And all of these are aerial hawkers. So they fly around, they catch insects on the wing, and often they scoop that um, membrane forward and catch them in, in midair. We also have gleaners, although admittedly this big brown bat here is um, showing that um, same scooping action with the membrane. But our main gleaner, I think, is um, the Macrotus water, I'll see. So if you see the name, if you see three names up here, it's because there's subspecies and when it comes to species, there's all often debates of species and subspecies. And if, you know, persons are claiming 
more species than there are, and that often comes down to genetics, but we won't get into that. But I've decided to share the subspecies name. So these two are claimed to be um, unique to Jamaica. But as you can see, the waterhouse leaf nose bat can take sizable prey. So they'll take moths, cockroaches, katydids in this instance. Um, and I think maybe small frogs. But if you notice, if you've noticed the equipment on the bats is a little different. The eye size, the air size going along and we'll get into why. And now we have the nectivores. So we have this one here, um, Pallas long tongue bat, which is a fairly common bat. And this is a, for those who don't know, this is a banana flower. So eventually each one of those, each one of these flowers here, uh, when pollinated becomes the uh, banana. And they're very important along with hummingbirds and bees and other uh, insects for pollination for a lot of crops. And if you, if you had a closer picture, you could see that actually on his tongue, he has a lot of papillae. And this particular bat, I think has the longest tongue for body ratio of all the bats. So the tongue really goes way up in, into the floor and you get this exchange of pollen on its face. Uh, here's another Jamaica flower bat and if you notice also, it has a gap in its front teeth. So the flower bats and the nectar feeders tend to have this space uh, or reduced teeth in the middle to allow the tongue to shoot forward and, and get the nectar. And if, again, if you notice, they have, compared to some of the nectar feeders, their eyes are more prominent, their ears aren't as big. And this is because those insect eating bats have to use echolocation, a more precise echolocation to navigate and catch moving targets, smaller prey that is moving. Whereas these bats are using smell, sight, and hearing to navigate their way to their food. And also you notice that that membrane between the back legs is reduced. They don't really need it. Even their wing ratio is a bit different because they flutter along and they fly well, but they don't need the same level of precise maneuverability to catch things on the wing. So these are our, our other two nectar feeders. Uh, it's a buffy flower bat. If you notice pollen all over his face, this is him returning from probably sticking his face in a, a large flower like our national tree, the uh, um, bloomer hole, which is a very large, it's a tree, but it's in the hibiscus family. So it will just shove its head down. If you notice also with this um, uh, leaf nose bat here, all the nectar feeders have a very pointed face. And this also is to aid in them getting into some of the flowers are being able to maneuver between you know, the petals and get their tongues right up. This one is actually feeding on a search my heart, which is a plant endemic to Cuba and Jamaica. And many plants actually have adapted to attract bats. So um, the shape of the flowers um, is easy to pick up through their echolocation. There are many studies on this. Uh, often the flowers are lighter in color because they're, you know, the light color flowers, especially night blooming flowers, they tend to see as white or very cream, even a very light green. And this is for um, ease of detection in limited um, light. And here we have our two frugivores. Uh, this one is also endemic, the Jamaican fig eating bat. And then despite the name Jamaican fruit eating bat and the species name being Jamaicensis, this fruit bat on the right is actually one of the most widely distributed fruit bats in the Americas. But again, 
chances are he was first described here in Jamaica. So it is found in Central America, I think parts of South America, the Caribbean, and even um, I think Florida. But many persons are very familiar with the presence of that bat. It's not a shy bat. It's um, if you have fruit trees, I've spoken to many persons who um, have had uh, uh, their fruits, um, things like maize berry, sweet sap, um, OTT apple, just raided by bats constantly. And also areas where the bats will temporarily roost on a, like an awning and they will fly with things like that, like an almond, a guinea. Um, they hang out and mess up the place. They're not afraid of urban areas. It's a very widespread common bat. And then back to the fig eating bat. If you notice, both of these bats have these very snub nose um, faces. And that's again to get right up on the fruit, to gnaw into it. Um, this one, the Jamaican fig eating bat is actually a, um, well, I'm going to get into that now, just, I don't have my slide for you. And this now, the last um, of the groups and the only one in this area, our largest bat, uh, the fish eating bat, or bulldog, greater bulldog bat. Um, as you can see in that photo, it catches fish. So it has these very large claws and it skims the water. Um, I think Liz had mentioned um, going out with me on a couple of occasions on a bird life trip. Uh, we went to specifically look for some at some ponds in parity. Um, and you can find them, I've seen them anywhere really that there's a still body of water, even if it's not that still like rivers along black rivers switch ponds we do crocodile surveys you see them skimming the water because the switch ponds often have fish and um when you see one at first that night you think oh it's a bird that's the size you know it's our largest bat i think no it's uh 50 to 90 grams and you know like a one meter wingspan tip to tip so it does when you, you catch it off guard it does look like a bat flying around in the night They're very very cool to see when you see them um, in action so in terms of habitat bats occupy um, a number of areas when they roost but primarily caves and as you can see by this list here there is overlap there are some species that are um, more generalist. So that one I mentioned before, uh, the Jamaican fruit eating bat, he is everywhere. So you'll find him on the very large palm, palm fronds in the trees. If it's an older, larger abandoned building, he'll be in there, they're in caves. Um, we'll have some insectivores that while they'll be in caves, they'll often be in between your roofs. And this is typically the Tadarida, which is a Mexican free tail bat, also molossus, molossus. And they become a nuisance issue. I don't like to use the word pest, but um, they'll be in between the shingles in roofs or in between the zinc and the board in roofs. There are little gaps and spaces. They make their home in there. And you can imagine that this, is, this isn't a unique problem to Jamaica um, and then you have Aretas that Bata just showed you who hangs out in the foliage and then that one Lacerius which is the Jamaica red bat which I personally have never seen actually it's never it hasn't been seen since the 70s uh, and that's an endemic and it's a high flyer tree dwelling bat so as you can imagine, in terms of finding bats, we go to the caves to find them or we go to other structures we know where the bats are to find them. This one is trickier to find. And we'll get into that. Oh, I'm sorry.
So a quick glance at um, some of the caves. So this is actually the Jamaican flower bat. Now it's not the only bat in this cave. I think there are three other species of bat, but as you can see how dense um, these bat caves can be with, in terms of um, populace. And this is, isn't even, this is not that large a cave, but this is a very important cave as you're going to find out. And then here you have that ghost face bat that we saw earlier. Uh, it's hard to tell, but the one, you can see how pointed these wings are. And these are a much faster, I want to say accurate jet fighter type, but they're quite cute, you know, red. Uh, if you see one up close, it's an interesting bat. Um, some say it's ugly, it's very cute and interesting. You know, the eyes start to sink into the ears, if that makes sense. Oops, yeah. So, it's a man-made structure. So we have here, On the left, this is Palace Long Tongue Bat. And these were in an abandoned um, hotel that was under construction and um, was left ruined. And you see, they, while these bats don't go in little spaces in roofs, if this building basically functions as a man made cave, so they'll take up spaces like this. And then on the right, I think these were some free tail bats. And this was a building, not an abandoned building. It was a shop underneath. And I think upstairs there's a, another business. But that little gap between the roof, and this was right in the park in, by the KFC. I noticed the bats flying around and then looked up. And sure enough, this was them exiting and uh, entering their roost in that little, little space. So, how do we know our bats are and um, looking for bats? We use a number of methods, um, harp trapping. So the top is that right photo and the two top photos are of a harp and it's basically two, well, this is one we made um a former um colleague at nepa built it from pvc because we found that traversing over a lot of the terrain to get to some of these caves using some of the commercial ones which are very much more sturdy became a bit problematic for us so he built this out of pvc but what the harps are basically two um frames with fishing line in between like a harp and they're framed against each other like that and a bag is placed at the bottom and what happened you put this at the mouth of a cave and sort of we set up some tarp there to funnel the bats as they exit and what the bats do is they hit into this line it doesn't hurt them and their natural instinct in when hitting something like they sort of fall and they fall into this bag where they're safe and we reach in pick them up and put them in little cloth bags and then we you know quickly assess and process them so in the photo below you see um i think that's andrea donaldson measuring you know taking measurements we're checking um species condition size uh pregnancy you know if there are any parasites various um things like that but typically it's looking at presence and absence, um, species composition. We have mist netting, I don't have a photo here, but it's just like bird mist netting, if anyone is familiar with that. Very large, thin nets that are put up on um, poles. And, you know, the bats, the bats fly in and you have to quickly get them out, get them into a small bag. It's my least preferred method because they often tangle themselves really quickly takes a lot of practice They tangle themselves, they're biting. Sometimes if they're close to each other and they're stressed out, they bite each other. Um, it's effective for sampling 
areas you know bats may be frequenting like watering holes to get an idea of the area as well that if you're not close to a roost we have acoustic detection uh, Damien is probably on the call, but Damien has been doing a lot of work with this, as has Dr. Koning. Um, they have audio moths and other bat detecting devices, and using the recordings of these various bat calls, you can ID which bat is where just from you know them flying around and calling. Uh, there are some limitations in some bats um, are quieter than others I think they're called whispering bats a lot of the leaf nose bats it's harder to detect even though you get that it's a bat call it's harder to differentiate by species because their frequencies are a bit um, lower and then we have photographic surveys that the bottom left photo is of dr fenton sherry's arm is in there um damon was with them for this and it's basically setting up a uh, a laser um, laser triggered photography sort of I call it a trap almost um, so as the bats are exiting it trips it and you, you know you get a, a, a quick a quick shot at, at the bats um, and it's less invasive than um, a harp trap or a missing where you're actually physically catching the bats and it can also give you um, an idea of what species are there. Uh, remember that because that is going to be mentioned later on. It's very important thing that happened. So uh, looking at caves in particular, all these red dots across the island are places that have been confirmed as bat roofs. Uh, there are many places that we have not officially confirmed. You get anecdotal um, information about the you know, bats are here, bats are there. We're going into this cave and see a bat. Now, sometimes you have caves that are temporary roosts. They're not really maternal roosts. And maternal roosts is where bats would actually be uh, reproducing. Uh, but sometimes you know it's just a few bats they're hanging out there for a couple of days or just for a night it's not a permanent residence per se but all of these um, little habitats are are important some of the threats i'm sort of heading towards the conservation um, aspect of things now so as with many things across the globe we have loss of habitat um, which is, you know, deforestation, urban development, agricultural development, um, mining, um, just the you know, loss of habitat in general, of cave disturbance. Um, that sometimes falls under um, the development issue because some caves have been used for attractions and depending on how you go about it it can have minimal impact or i shouldn't say minimal less impact than others um you have persons that just curious go into caves because it's there you want to see what's inside you walk through this has been going on for ever as you can imagine um a lot of our indigenous artifacts were found in caves and caves hold a uh, cultural significance to many persons across the globe as well and just being in the cave can be a problem for the bats um hold on sorry yeah so many of the bats uh they breed once a year and in some places in some instances also twice depending on conditions Bats are quite remarkable. Some are able to delay pregnancy. So they'll, um, they'll mate. They'll probably, you know, have uh, a fetus and, and stop the process, depending on how conditions are. But they typically breed once a year. Now, when they do have their pups, the pups are really vulnerable. You know, they're just in the cave, hanging out there, um, the parents have to go out and feed every night 
if the puck falls onto the ground, that's it. Usually, one, they can't fly, they can't crawl very well. And the other residents of the cave are only too glad to quickly take up this meal. So when persons go into caves, especially with lights, and it disturbs them, they get frightened, they fall, you lose a bat um, for that year. Um, persons often carry things into caves. Some, if it's not a light, they would use torches, um, a kerosene lamp, the soot, various chemicals um, from the fire also creates a problem in the cave. It makes it quite noxious. And that, so that's where the cave disturbance comes in. Um, loss of foraging areas, I mentioned that that falls also into the loss of habitat. Um, general insect decline is a worldwide problem um, because of, again, loss of habitat, um, monoculture, the loss of biodiversity in vegetation trickles down into or up into loss of um, biodiversity amongst insects and bats. Um, and this also ties back to things like loss of habitat. So when you clear for agriculture, you lose a variety of plants. You're also introducing pesticides. There's also light pollution that takes away a lot of insects from the populace. If you think about every light that you have outside and the number of insects that fly to it and just die and extrapolate that, and that is also taking away from um, the foraging ability of the bats. Uh, of guana harvesting, which overlaps with the cave disturbance, but also has um, other implications. Now in that photo, there's a gentleman harvesting some guana. These images are from some camera traps that we have set up at a very important cave. This cave is the only known roosting cave for the Jamaica flower bat. Um, and persons often go into caves and harvest guano for fertilizer, especially for the ganja industry. And this has been an ongoing issue for many decades. Uh, recently, I don't know if Wendy's on the call, but Wendy shared a, a photo. She had done an article years ago for Jamaica Naturalists on the issue. And it is believed to be one of the best fertilizers for ganja. So before, when it was illegal, it was being used. And now when there's um, legal commercial um, applications, it's also being sought out. But in order to harvest the guana, you have to disturb the bats. Um, there are different ways to go about it. But in most instances, persons just go in with lights or they're going with um, their torches. In some instances, persons smoke the bats out, and this is coming from a place of ignorance. You know, they don't know better, but they treat it like bees. So, you know, you use bees, you know, you smoke to disturb the bees in the box to get the honey. They do the same thing, but it's with um, disastrous outcomes. And to add another layer to it, many of our bats like hot caves. Some of our more finicky and endangered bats have developed this affinity for very, very hot caves. And hot caves are uh, unique in that these caves often have areas of great constriction. And, or in the case of this cave, this only has one entrance. So it's one way in, one way out. Only one um, uh, air can only get into this section. And the guano itself, the body heat from the bats and the guano itself fermenting helps produce this heat. They like the heat and when it's nice and hot, they're able to thrive and reproduce and produce more, more guano to produce more heat and they have this symbiotic relationship. And often when a lot of the guano is removed, it changes the microhabitat and then the bats don't breed as often and eventually have this population decline that seems to happen suddenly, but it's because there is a lack of recruitment of new bats while the older ones die off. And so that's one of the issues, one of the main issues we have with guana harvesting in certain caves. 
Unfortunately, Jamaica is a case study around in the bad circles of where things have gone wrong um, in the past because of commercial guana harvesting and changing the species composition of caves. And then we have invasive species, which is just a common thing across the world with um, most conservation uh, initiatives and species decline. In this case, that picture there is of a bat, of bat wings sticking right out of the mouth of a cat. I didn't find the video in time to put into the uh, presentation, but we have videos of the cats just launching and catching bats out of the air. Uh, a cat would, um, we have somewhere some individual cats take 10 bats a night. Uh, this fluctuates throughout the year as how frequent the cats enter. But as you can imagine, especially it seems that they're taking very young bats, um, bats that are not um, just learning to fly, really. So they are easy targets. And then in this case, the mongoose would come in the day and eat the wings that were left over. So there would often be no evidence of this bat predation unless you know we set up camera traps and see what's going on rats also will go into the caves and take on um, low-hanging fruit as it were you know young bats that are are hanging close down and uh, also cockroaches american cockroach that would have been introduced into a lot of the caves because of the guana harvesters they often would take buckets or other paraphernalia with them that have roaches in it after you know extracting guano previously but what are we doing um conservation efforts so from the legislative standpoint um well you have listings so we have two critically endangered um bats both endemic the flower bat and the funnel layered bat and both of them as I mentioned, like these particularly hot caves, the Phylonycterus in particular was found in many caves across the island and had gone missing for a while. Uh, the red bat hasn't been detected since the 70s. Again, maybe because it is hard to detect, we're not sure, but it is also a foliage um rooster so is it that habitat and insect habitat loss and insect decline have played a part not sure but the good thing is that for the vast majority of the bats they are of least concern um that's where we stand with those so in terms of legislation the Wildlife Protection Act was amended in 2016 to include two bats. Um, it needs to include one more, and that's being worked on. Um, the Endangered Species Act um, covers a larger number of bats, and that is for um, trade. But so at NEPO, we actually do development orders as it, the P is not is for planning in NEPO and we work with the planning branch and the local area planners and we go out and we do assessments to inform um, development in the island. And since 2009, it's in, we've made it imperative that, you know, the caves are designated conservation areas, um, especially caves with large populations of bats or a diverse population of bats. Um, well, a management plan that was um, finalized in 2014 and is currently being implemented. We produce uh, information like brochures and we do um, public engagements. Uh, um yeah we also going to mention our partners at bad conservation international 
now actually but they recently produced some stickers um they have been working with um science and um with ue on their stem program and they had been um doing some work there with them in terms of educating uh, the youth on bats and we'll be doing more of these type of joint initiatives um so also as i mentioned earlier we deal with the public a lot when it comes to wildlife response there is a a welcomed a slight misunderstanding most persons believe that all bats are protected and we try to emphasize that yes they should and we don't really stray away from that but we, we advise persons that are having human back conflicts often when it comes to roosting in houses um, we give advice on how to exclude bats humanely and how to coexist with bats so i spend a lot of the time talking on the phone trying to explain things or doing site visits along that line we also there's also inclusion in tor it's an example of one here for um, in environmental impact assessments at the focus be placed on bats and how these proposed developments um, may affect them or putting in various mitigations for bats. Um, yeah, so narrowing down on this particular case in which we have, this is Jamaican for bat again. So it was previously, the last previous recording of the bat was in 97. And before, after that, it wasn't being picked up um, in various surveys around Ireland. Uh, there were some monies from Nature Cut from TNC to look for this flower bat in 2006. And I entered the fray in 2011 when Andrea was well on the way going through this but she and a team at nepa had found um final interest at this one cave on a private property in 2011 and it's as i mentioned the only known roosting habitat so the natural resource conservation authority um nepa falls under took the decision to purchase the land that the cave is located on. It's, a, it's in a precarious spot. It's literally, the land is right beside the main road in this area. And then the rest of the surrounding lands were already subdivided for um, housing and residential development. Um, during this process, uh, Bat Conservation International uh, reached out to Nepal with regards to the Jamaican funnel layered bat, which is in another cave, a very important cave in terms of biodiversity and um, bat, um, bat density in another area of the island. And those discussions went on. And during that, they were brought up um, the floor bat, which are very excited to jump on and, as well. So in 2018, they made their first visit and we went out um, to both St. Clair Cave, where the funnel layered bat is, and the uh, Stony Hill Cave, where the Jamaica floor bat is located, and did some more surveys and getting a lay of the land and seeing what could be addressed. So as again, you see, here's another harp. Actually, this is us climbing down the um, roots of a large fig tree this is actually how you enter um saint Clair's cave and this isn't even actually entering the cave you enter through us you enter a sinkhole and then from the sinkhole it goes down into a cave it's actually quite spectacular to sit at the top of the sinkhole and watch the bats emerge uh this is one of the trips in 2019 and going into stony hill cave wanted to test out some new equipment which we're going to get into now so 
from some of those early giant trips with um, Bat Conservation International here is Jan Paul from Jamaica Cave Organization. And they have been very instrumental in helping um, and doing a lot of bat work, actually. They go to the caves, the city caves, they've been recording information for years, sharing information. They guide us when we're going to, when we're doing these various assessments. Um, to Dr. Young from Pacific Rim Conservancy, we're going to get into what she's offering um, us to help us with soon. Uh, Dr. Freak, the Davlos, um, to Soto. This team went down. We not only set up camera traps, uh, you see Dr. Young going through um, some of the troubleshooting for the settings, camera traps to see what the predation is like, to see what the guana harvesting is like. That's where we got those previous photos from. Um, but we also, these are some bat wings from the cats, collected bat wings. This is um, the guys preserving and prepping the bat wings, want to know what species are being taken because, you know, what if the cats are target for whatever reason, different flight patterns, um, how low they exit the cave. What if the cats are primarily um, taking out the critically endangered bat versus the very common one? Uh, these are various questions you want answered. Um, from that, we've gone on to improve on our technologies. So on the far right is one of the regular motion triggered, I say regular like it's a common thing, right? Motion triggered camera traps um, that take both video and still photos, infrared and regular photos. And recently we installed this nice um, solar powered one that is connected to cellular and it updates once a photo is taken, it just sends it to your phone. So we've been getting real time, unfortunately not video, but real time updates of when the camera is being triggered. And it's as um, John who from BCI who has set up says it's, while he's glad that he's getting these real time updates, it is a little annoying to see how often the cats actually actually um, go and predate. Uh, in addition, we've been using LiDAR to map the caves to fully understand the, the footprint of the cave and inform further conservation decisions. Uh, so you're seeing here, this is actually Stony Hill Cave. As I mentioned, if you look at this little photo to the left, the main road goes along like that. The cave mouth is right here. And the cave actually, if you, if you look at this video here, it goes down underneath the main road and across the road here. So this is the main cave. So that is the, let's see if I can stop it there, sorry. Oops. Yep, so that's the main road. And in the cave, it's a hop over the wall where the guano harvesters tend to just park the car, hop over the wall, go down into the cave. You walk down here, and then this is the actual entrance of the cave. And then in here is a critically endangered Jamaica flower bath. And as you can see, it gets, it's an open chamber and then it constricts all the way back there. And I mean, these, temperatures get up to like 100 degrees Fahrenheit. It's really, really hot, 100% humidity. It's awful. The bats love it. And the guana harvesters, they bury it to get this um, black gold, as it were. But we are, so this is, this was done um, for Stony Hill Cave. St. Clair's Cave, which I should have included, is a much more extensive cave with multiple entrances, a very large cave system. Uh, the intention is to later this year do a full LiDAR scan. It's going to take them about five days on and off to go through the cave. The intention is to go through the cave when the bats are not there. So it would be in the night 
when the bats are out to minimize disturbance. So in all of the things we're doing, we're trying more and more to minimize while doing the work impact to the bats because and to actually talk to each other more in terms of different groups doing different work in the same cave because you find persons will go and do work here and not you don't know another set of persons going to work here you don't know and then cumulatively there's greater disturbance among the bats even though you're all everyone's aim is preservation you don't want to inadvertently be a problem it's also we also plan to do this for green gutto especially as the jamaica floor bat was detected there in 2019 by Dr. Fenton and Damian using the, the photo traps, um, the photo surveys. I found a few, not roosting, but here again, trying less invasive methods. This was recent. We're trying um, the use of infrared cameras because again, white light disturbs the bats. So using infrared in this instance here, we tested this in another cave. This is a Jamaican fruit bat. This is, this is me pointing my camera at the roof of the cave. So you see how dark it is. And this is the screen on a camera that's set up on a tripod pointing up using the infrared. And the bats in that photo are actually behaving how they would if not disturbed. They're unagitated. So for us, that was successful trial to show that the use of the infrared was not disturbing the bats to a point that was noticeable to us. I mean, who knows? Further research may show that the infrared is perceived by the bats to some degree. But as far as we know, the infrared versus the white light is vast difference in how they react and behave. So this is John trying another handheld, um, smaller version, sort of just peeking into um, Stony Hill Cave, not going in to disturb anything to see if we could get anything. And good results. Here's a Jamaican floor bat just hanging out, undisturbed. Um, interesting to note, we didn't notice this before because we weren't surveying in this way. Many of them just hang with one foot. And this is them just chilling out, um, preening, sort of cooling off. Um, and the idea is to be able to maybe go in, set up a camera, or scan the area with the camera, infrared camera, and then now use artificial intelligence to count. And you now would be able to get an idea of the population in the cave using um, non-invasive methods and um, this type of technology. Actually, a lot of the AI is so good now that you'll be able to program um, the different species. So you'll be able to say, you know, you have 50 of Phylonycterus or 10 of um, Pteranotus in this section and go through like that. So these are things that are being explored. Most recently, and quite exciting, is the use of eDNA, which is environmental DNA. Um, so what they are, quite a few companies are um, offering this methodology now, not just for bats, but for things in general. DNA can be quite persistent in the environment. So what we do, or what we're doing with this set now, um, and BCI has tested it in places like Guinea and it's worked quite well. You go somewhere, you take water samples, you push it through that little filter, then you put a reagent in, you seal it up, and then you send it to the lab. And they are now able to tell you, well, you're asking for them to detect what is present, what DNA is present in the water. Now, this DNA could have been deposited there through drinking, through feces, through urine, through contact. 
and bats have to drink water and they often find areas of still water it could be a pool a sewage pond a natural pond a slow river but they skim just like if you've seen swifts or other birds like that just skim the water and drink that's what bats do as well and this will help with presence and absence so if you want to know if certain bats are in a certain area you could sample some water send it off and then you would know down to the genus or even species if you have those um, DNA markers available to test. In the case of this, which is again, fingers crossed, quite exciting. This pond, I took this photo in July. We recently visited this pond and this pond in Queen's Heights, Queen Heights is the last place the red bat was caught in 1973. Uh, so we have some samples and we have some more um, sites to collect from before we send off everything um, and they'll be able to even though they don't have the markers for this exact species they do have for the genus um, so we'd be able to know say if the bat is still drinking from this pond and it would be a confirmation that the bat's still around so And other good news, uh, with the help of BCI, um, the NRCA was able to purchase a cave with the Jamaican floor bat. And then, um, I mean, it took a lot of time and effort. There were uh, misunderstandings and back and forth and Uncertainty is, but it's done now. And now we have the possession of that cave to now put physical protection and um, implement a lot of plans to protect the cave. Next one is over here, which is um, St. Clair's Cave, where the Jamaican Funnelier bat is. So far, we've located the current owners and I've been in dialogue with them. As I mentioned earlier, this is another perspective of how you enter the sinkhole area before actually going into the cave. It's this magnificent fig tree. You climb down the roots and it's like a, a nice platform and you can just sit in there and the bats, the bats come out. But so, and again, good feeling about this one. But once we get the land and protect it, what next? One of the things I mentioned, the doctor, sorry about that, I don't know what is happening. Yep. I mentioned earlier, Dr. Young from Pacific Rim, they specialize in predator proof fencing. And they do this work a lot with um, ground roosting seabirds in the Pacific. And it's basically a, it's an exam, a, little more, a little example of it here. It's a type of fencing that has a hood um, that prevents cats or rats or among these other things from entering. And if some, for some odd reason they do enter or they were fenced in the area once the fencing was done, they were able to climb over and you know, slide off the top there and not go back in. So... That's one of the things um, later this year as well, now that the land has been acquired and we have permission to look at exactly what to do with the other land that we're in negotiations with you now to implement the predator-proof fencing as best as possible. And that should reduce that aspect. Uh, the public engagement um, is to be ramped up as well in terms of getting the communities to protect the area, um, wean those that are in the area of the guano harvesting and get them to sort of be protective or not sort of, to be protective of the caves from persons from the outside that want to come and, and harvest guano. Another thing is bat boxes. So this bat condominium here is another example. In many places around the world, they have these set up and for those bats that like to dwell in roofs, 
Um, they basically, the, the form these little colonies in these boxes. And when you open that hatch at the bottom, you get all this guano. So for some of the farmers that swear by guano or want guano, um, they would be able to have these on site by the farms. Now, it's not an immediate fix to the situation because a lot of the guano that they go and harvest has been deposited over decades and millennia, thousands of years in some instances and other, you know, just sediment at this point. And they just go and harvest it. Whereas these, it would take time to build up. Sometimes it takes a lot of time before the bats actually start to occupy the boxes. But this is one of the things we want to implement and explore. Uh, the use of live traps to remove invasives now, especially when it comes to cats, um, public perception and catching and what you do with the cats once you catch them is a issue. Uh, some of the person, some of the cats um, belong to neighbors, that type of thing. So it's a tricky situation, but it's in some instances you may need to you know, catch, remove, or euthanize some of the invasives. Um, looking at cave use guidelines, some have um, been drafted, and there are others that um, we can use elsewhere. Some of the considerations are, you know, what's the species composition of the cave? What's the type of cave? Is it um, by harvesting guana from that cave? Are you affecting it? All caves are created equal, but my personal preference is to treat all caves with kick gloves until proven otherwise. Uh, and as I mentioned, I'm going to be taking a closer look at Green Grotto and some other caves. Why I mentioned Green Grotto? Green Grotto is a, a, an attraction here. It's a big cave system. For many years, it's been used in different ways, nightclub, um, a bar. No, it's a tourist attraction, um, many persons going in and out. But it is also one of um, the areas that the uh, Jamaica floor bat had been previously recorded. Now, in 2019, uh, I'm jumbled and a little ahead, but in 2019, this group of persons you see down in the bottom right, uh, Dr. Fenton, Dr. Sarah Fenton, Dr. Susan Koning from Windsor Research and Damian White went and did the photo surveys and they confirmed that there were some Jamaican floor bats flying out. Now they were all males and um, sometimes male bats will, you know, like many males go off on soldier and looking for females. And even though they may not be roosting or reproducing in that cave, the fact that they're there, this cave is at the other end of the island from where we know there we have an actual maternal roost, indicates that unbeknownst to us, there are caves somewhere, or there's a population, be it small, because I think there were only, hopefully Damien's on this call, um, uh, maybe two, four males that they found, but they're, that they're present. So that gives us hope that it's not just this cave um, in Portland that is, um, are, has the most of that particular species. But uh, just want to acknowledge a lot of the persons that um, I hope I don't miss anyone that have been instrumental in all of this work and information that I'm presenting. Andrea Donaldson, who I mentioned earlier, who is now my senior manager for basically introducing me and holding my hand through BATS, uh, the legal services branch at NEPA. Um, I badgered them a lot. There was a lot of back and forth. I did a lot of work to get acquired at Cave. Um, going forward, I know we can figure out the other Cave, uh, the ecosystems branch. Uh, we all collectively do this work, even though different persons are, have specialist tasks, but we all collectively go out and do this work and sort of, we share the load. Uh, the JCO who I mentioned earlier, uh, Damian, Dr. Koning, uh, BCI, 
here's us heading out um, 2019 to St. Clair's Cave. Uh, this is the team, Angelo does a lot of fossil work. He went, you know, looking for fossils as well. He took that lovely photo at the beginning. Stefan and Jan, who are our cavers. Eh? Well, Stefan and Jan have helped so much in terms of all this research, not just at Nepal, but with all the, the bat people and others who do um, work with caves and other cave obligate species. And um, Dr. Davalos, Anna, Kyle, uh, Dr. Young, who will be coming to um, help set up the fences later. Dr. Frick, John, who has um, is basically in charge of BCI's work in Jamaica, who has been immensely helpful with the equipment, getting the equipment, helping with resources, helping figure out a lot of our challenges. Um, and Jason, who is doing all of the mapping work and his team will be doing more of that work um, later on this year. And I think, yes, that's it. I, I think I managed to sort of get through a lot of stuff without, I didn't have my notes readily available, but I hope I didn't miss anything or confuse anyone too much, but thank you. Thank you so much, Damani. That was absolutely fascinating. And there's been so many kind of really positive uh, comments coming through the chat. People really enjoyed the session. You you gave us such a comprehensive kind of overview. You were talking about, you, you gave us an overview of the species, talking about the feeding. I was particularly interested in how the kind of different lifestyles of the bats affect their body features. I thought that was really fascinating. You talked about the habitats. You, you talked about all the surveying work the threats and then really kind of comprehensive discussion of all the kind of activity that's going on around conservation and about the research and the current projects that are happening as well. And it's really nice to see the whole team of people involved at the end as well. Well, we're, we're kind of really short of time in, ter for in terms of questions. There's been questions so where people have kind of answered, asked things in the chat and other people have kind of jumped in and helped answer those. So that's been really great. I don't know, Anchor, if you just great, want to great. pick up maybe one question, one or two questions, just to finish us off, because I know we are running a bit late. I, oops, yeah, let me just find the questions. Yeah, as you said, some of them were answered um, by um, Damien and others uh, throughout, but um, okay, I'll just, you know, maybe this will be an easier, I hope, easier question to answer. Um, do you know the range and distances bats will fly to forage? Ah, uh, um, so. Unfortunately, um, that's one of the things I meant had in my notes. Let me see if I can find it. But it depends on the species. So some are, um, and this is why habitat is important. Some are able to travel great distances across, the, across I want to say, open space, while others actually prefer forest cover and need um, a more uh, humid area. So the funnel layered bats are sm small little fluttering bats as well. They would be sort of restrict restricted to these forested areas and their range might not be as wide. Um, I don't remember, I hope, I'm wondering if anyone in the chat, can't give you off the top of my head, the range, but some of them, they do um, go quite far, numerous kilometers. So forage versus where they are um, actually roost. And some instances they, um, they forage nearby and then and then come back to the roost multiple times, especially if they're um, suckling. And as I mentioned with the fruit bats, some of the fruit bats earlier, they will fly pretty far, go and feed and hang out somewhere in between 
to you know eat and I call it hanging out at the bar. They sort of stop, they eat, they chat, they crap, they, they do all sorts of things. Like this is often on persons' verandas or gazebos. They make a mess with all the fruit, and that's a sort of in between way before you know heading home. But I would love to follow up and give you uh, more accurate information, but I don't have it at the top of my head now. I mean, one of the things we can do is we send out an email um, after the event to let people know when the recording's available. And it's possible if you're happy to just pick up a few questions um, that we can kind of email them to you. You can give us some answers. We can circulate those to everybody as well. Oh, yes, so, that's, well, should we? Should we? Yeah, we could. I mean, that, that'd be that's great. Perfect. If you're happy to follow up, yeah, that's yeah, no, we're, we're definitely happy to do that. Yeah. Um, so, Anchor, if you just want to pick up one, lot, is there one last question you'd like to pick up from the chat to, just to finish us off? Um, well, okay, yeah, very, I think a very brief one. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, my voice is going today. Um, so Laura was wondering how many babies do bats usually have? Uh oh, uh oh, uh <laughs> oh, I, I'm unfortunately, I'm not doing anything. Oh, it's my internet. Sorry. I didn't hear the question. I'm sorry. If... Sorry. Um, I was just wondering, um, Laura actually had a question. Yes. How many babies do bats usually have? In their lifetime or in... I think in a one? single breeding season. It's typically one. So... Um, in some instances, and that's one of the things we actually want to determine, especially with the critically endangered ones, if they have two. So sometimes it's two for, this, for the year, for the season, um, but it's normally one. I mean, if it's a really, really good year and things are going very well and everything is great, then it's possibly two in some instances, but the general thing is one. So... It's often, when you do mention that to persons, it's actually a little hard for them to believe because of a couple of things. You know, you think, again, as I mentioned, rat bats, right? So people think of bats as a rodent. People also think of rabbits as rodents. And you know how many um, young rabbits and dogs and cats and rats have each time. So the assumption is that I see a lot of bats flying around so there must be a lot of bat production, but it's a cumulative thing. So it's usually once a year. And so that's obviously why that's so critical if you get a high loss of, of pups, you know, like you kind of mentioned with the, particularly with the cave disturbance, that just can have a massive impact on the population really very quickly, just because of that low kind of reproductive, those numbers, low numbers of, of pup production. So, um, what, what we'll do is we'll pick